film once or twice as well. Very, very long time ago. Anyway, let's get started with the show. <sighs> welcome to Overwatch, and welcome to another episode of Coaching the Many. You can see on the screen all the, the, the palaver going on. We're going to be doing a couple of different things today. Today, as you can probably tell from the title, is focused a lot on communication, uh, because we are running a six stack. Uh, and we're also going to be talking about um, niche hero picks, also how to deal with some unique situations, because there's a lot of stuff that goes on in this game, uh, and I'm going to like read a lot of the email that sort of came along with it just to explain the situation, because there is a lot going on with this game. Um, so, right, so looking at the, the email, we have, okay, uh, quick background. The six stack isn't pl uh, the six stack I'm playing isn't a group I play with regularly. Four of us play together on a team, while the other two, me, machine, and space squid, are subs. So four of them are regulars, two of them are not. Uh, we usually base our comp around four supports because they, if you watch Scream Central a while ago, a team called Overly Supportive, which is pretty much all support mains, were playing in one of the tournaments, and yeah, they they were having a good time with that. Um, so they play with four supports, Zarya and Genji. Uh, this, so the comps that they're going to be playing are not what they're used to, and they're experimenting with things. They ran into the same six act twice in a row. We're looking at the second of the two games. And they ran six DPS. Uh, the enemy team ran six DPS, and that caused all kinds of problems. Uh, as someone who personally relies on shotcalling to win games, how could I have shotcalled against this comp? They outdamaged our healing and ran a variant of dive comp with Tracer Genji on the backline. We do to pick off anything that turned around. Cheers, General Confusion. Thank you, General Confusion. Great name. Um, right. Oh, my favorite was... Um, oh, God, what was it? So one, it's not actually a rank in the Navy, but it's a form of address in the US Navy is seaman. And so, like, so you can have, like, seaman stains, for example. So if someone's last name is called Stains and they're in the Navy, they get called Seaman Stains and it's, it's hilarious. Anyway, before we begin as well, I do want to say that uh, if you do want to send footage into Coaching the Menu, you send it into oamreviews at gmail.com. Uh, we've been a little thin on the ground on submissions lately, so a couple more submissions would really be quite nice. I saw someone asking, have you got Roadhog footage? No, actually, new Roadhog footage would be great to see, uh, so I'd love to see some of that as well. Uh, otherwise, imreviews at gmail.com, include the hero name in the title and the rank and then a description and then the YouTube video or whatever you've uploaded it to. Anyway, let's get started with the review. Okay. Bye, chat. Thank you, chat. And let's get going. So these guys are going to be talking a lot in the background, but I'm going to be talking over them. So they played against these guys before, the enemy team that they're going up against, they played against them before. Um, and they basically ran a 60 DPS comp and smashed these guys. So now they're meeting them for the second time, and they're going to be playing, uh, trying to adapt to how to deal with this stuff. And they're going to be running a, a relatively cheesy comp, uh, but it, it can work. This is a comp that can really work. So let's see. And I'm going to. Oh. Oh. Oh, coffee. There was a U.S. Army horse once with the name Sergeant Reckless. Nice. Uh, if you if you ever look at um, Blackadder Goes Forth, which is a superb British series, uh, the Blackadder series in general, the fourth series is set in World War One, and it's called Blackadder Goes Forth. And every episode is named uh, for a military pun. So I think the first episode is like Private Parts. One of them I think is Major Star, for example, or stuff like that. Darling, yes, sit down, darling. A running joke in the show. One of the captains is called Darling, and he's like, Sit down, Darling! Take my coat, Darling! What are you talking about, Darling? Stephen Fry. Beautiful. So, Torbjorn, right? Torbjorn. Let's talk about Torbjorn before we even get started. We are running this cheese comp with Torbjorn. We've got a, what I call a burner turret. I'll call these burner turrets, because the idea is you just put them down. They're there to be burned away. They don't matter. You don't care about them. They're just going to get you some ult charge. Don't give the enemy team any ult charge. It's quite nice. Um, so... This location for it, I actually am not the biggest fan of because basically the enemy team, we draw a schematic of the road they're about to go down. We've got the turret right here, and so they're about to come through here, and then it's like the cover over here. The second they come around here, they'll be able to see this turret, and they'll just blow it up. Like, close range is pretty good for everyone. Turret range doesn't really have a huge impact. Putting it in here, for example, would work ni quite nicely, or putting it around the back over here would work quite nicely. The idea is that you want the turret to sort of trip people up, and so this is just in their path, and so it's very obvious to see. Um, which way you're going, like, where the turret is, and then they'll just kill it as 
sort of as part of their journey towards the main choke point. With these burner turrets, if you play on Hollywood, for example, Torbjorns do this a lot where you have the, the spawn doors here with the Chinese theater, there's a wall like this. And then you got like the road. And the turret's usually like over here with the main first choke point is like over this way. And so people will go up the road and then it's like, oh wait, we're getting shot by a turret over here. Like this is a lot more effective. It's just, it's very frustrating and it sort of trips people up a lot. Um, so just avoid putting it like right in people's faces. But we are running cheese, okay? We are running the finest cheddar you can possibly imagine. First things first, um, when orienting your cheese, Orisa should start with a barrier, like, if she wants to place a barrier like this, she can, uh, but she should put it out as early as possible, uh, just so that it can catch some damage, and then the barrier should honestly be, like, back here. Uh, the enemy team trying to push through the choke, remember, and I can already have two, three-ish pathways. You can come in around the top, you can come in through main, and you can come in through this side. And so by having a barrier here, you're covered from all sides, the only thing that's scary is if a fire goes, like, all the way all the way around the outside, takes the two trailer park girls route and goes all the way around the outside, around the outside, around the outside. Uh, and even that is manageable. This barrier is way too far forward because the danger is that the enemy team can just push through it and they will be able to start damaging the Bastion, for example, before that you guys are really ready to deal with it. We should absolutely... I want to see what... Our turret's up, shooting, 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 gets destroyed. Yeah, we, we should, like, the highest priority now is get a turret up. The thing with Torbjorn is this, right? We have to... Um, it takes time for us to set up. And so any time you want set up, you have to start setting up again as quickly as possible. Because if you are too late with Torbjorn, you are too late. And, like, this is already too late. This feels bad. You, like, doing this feels scary. And also what we're doing is we're dividing up our pressure. So the Orisa can't cover us both. Orisa's very good at covering one location, so we're not playing around the tank we have very well. Um, where this turret isn't really going to be able to do much. Like, the second this tracer appeared, we just had to give up on this turret, basically. Because setting this up, it's just instantly going to get killed. It's literally in sight of the enemy team as they push in. They're running a May as well, so it's going to be kind of tricky. I kind of like the enemy team comp here for dealing with this. Um, the May especially is quite cute. But we really want to be going around here and sort of setting up around the Bastion. Um, not, ne not directly on top of him, but relatively near him, so that the Orisa can cover both the turret and the Bastion with one barrier. Otherwise, just going to back up, and then, again, this is a situation where we should just be watching our cooldown, and we should just be building a turret. Like, just throw down a level 1 turret, start shooting the Farah. Good. Okay, Farah's backing off. We should go and finish our turret off now. Like, it, it sounds weird to say, but the tier 1 turret does about 25 DPS, tier 2 turret does about 50, 55 DPS. So the tier 2 turret is actually literally twice as effective. Um, it's just, it costs you nothing to do as well, so you should just be trying to get this tier 2 turret up if possible, and then you should worry about running around shooting stuff, collecting scrap, stuff like that. Um, especially when, like, tracers are involved in the map. Tracer... And Farah especially will have a really hard time doing huge amounts of anything as long as that turret is alive. Nice, nice. And the turret and the Bastion combined will do a huge amount of work and putting pressure on the um, on the Farah, on the Genji, on the Tracer. It just makes their lives very difficult. Here we do something quite silly. Uh, behold. So, guess what's about to happen next? Yeah. Uh, you can imagine Widowmaker just looking through a scope and then suddenly like this little face is like, like, uh, like Torbjorn, uh, and then pfft, dead. Um, don't step in front of Widowmakers. Like, it's, it, do, it does not go well. Here, you can see, you can see the very moment that she blew his brains out. Um, yeah, we, we just, hmm, no. And like, the question I have is, what are we doing here? What, what is our objective in doing this motion? Where are we looking for? Um, like, what are we looking to do here? Okay, we get the Farah. The pressure backs off. We need to regroup and we need to set up again. Us running forward here. Okay, we spot the Genji. We get the deflect from Genji, pick some armor up. And then it's like we're charging on the front lines to try and fight stuff. Our turret's still level one. It's not in the greatest position in the world. We could be doing more here. In these instances with Torbjorn, by the way, just stay on the side and just ping her in the head with uh, left clicks. The left clicks from Torbjorn actually do quite a lot of damage. Um, and right clicking Widowmaker is difficult because if we sort of... Actually, can I, I should be able to do this? If I uh, do this... Oh, and let me hit this like this. No, if I do this... 
Whoa, okay, that fucks everything up for me. Let's not risk it with that. Uh, okay, let me do it like this then. If I grab this and do this, no, that didn't do it. Don't know what I've done there. I've ruined something, clearly. Uh, position... I don't know what I've managed to click there, but hey. I go to here and click this, and then do this. Okay. Alright, I want to bring Widowmaker front and center of the screen, because this is actually very important information if you play heroes like uh, Reaper, like Torbjorn, anything with a shotgun, Roadhog. This sort of info is, is super, super useful. So you can see Widowmaker here. Again, hitboxes. We're thinking about hitboxes. Widowmaker's hitbox is literally this. And then her arm. The booty. The legs. And her feet. Okay, this, this is Widowmaker's hitbox. It's tiny. It's absolutely tiny. She's a thin sliver of a thing. Widowmaker's head hitbox is quite large. Widowmaker's head is actually pretty big compared to a lot of other heroes. Um, but her actual hitbox is tiny. So if we start doing damage with our left clicks, or uh, with our right clicks, we're actually sort of hitting like this area. And most of that is like, it's about a couple of percent. It's like not even a, th it's about a third. About a third of the shots are going to land and actually do something. Um, so yeah, Torbjorn's damage is the same as McCree. 70 per nail, 140 on a headshot. In instances like this, Widowmakers are actually very predictable in how they position and how they move, so they're actually um, pretty easy to deal with. We go... Let me fix this again. There we go. So the way Widows move, like if we just sort of go back and we just watch in slow motion, uh, Widow running around, so go here. You can see when she's scoping up, her movements are very, very slow, and like her head barely moves. And so just a couple of left clicks into that, two left clicks and she would die. And trust me, the amount of times if you get a flank on a Widow and just do two left clicks, um, easy, easy kill. And it means that you could also just stay in position over here. You could just ping shots in from the side. It's easy enough to do. If you're going to be playing Torbjorn, doing this sort of stuff is absolutely important. Um, don't just run in and suicide with the right clicks. It, I, all I can, I can just imagine her staring down the scope and it just, the, the face, the bearded face like jumping in just from the bottom of the scope. Ah! And then boom, just gone. Like she, she probably just like jumped, she flinched and like blew his head off. So comms like this always Here's worry me. When people say stuff like, oh the Widow's good, the Widow's good. This is going to be a recurring theme. Uh, just as we focus on the communication a little bit. Because, spoiler alert, they, they lose this fight. Um, so we're going to go back over this because we want to talk about comms, right? We want to talk about how can you communicate your way through this. So first things first, you are running Tor, we are running Tor Bastion, um, so that means that you are going to be playing in a death ball comp, it means you are going to be playing relatively solidly and you're going to be just hunkered up on top of each other. When you understand that, convey it to your team, make sure your team all are on the same game plan. Guys, we're going to play together, we're going to play solidly. Um, don't split up and then just announce where threats are and focus and kill threats. Keep Bastion alive, Bastion high prio. So let's listen to the comms. Yeah, he's here. What is the tongue point? Trace is running around. Trace is running around. Yeah, trace the left side is usually a little bit better. Or trace the right side, trace the stairs, trace the tunnel. Welcome to Overwatch, Monsieur. Thank you, Shellfish5, also. Welcome. Love you on board. So, again, like this is where shot calling can start mattering when we're starting to do a reposition. These sorts of movements are going to be very important, mostly for the Bastion and for like the front line, because the front line aren't necessarily going to see this. So, this is just a case of guys fall back to the point, regroup on point. And, like, that's it's just keeping everyone on the same page and making sure that everyone knows the current plan. Okay, I like that. Focus far. Okay, far is dead. This is where we should be rebuilding. I'm good. Okay. Like you, this, this to me is the signs that you know people are now relaxing. So this fight is technically over, right? And this is how I see this: is this fight is kind of over. We should focus on regrouping, rebuilding, and setting up our death ball again. Uh, you got Bastion Torbjorn, that takes time to set up. You've got to make sure that it is set up and stable. And when it is, then you're fine. The play that we're making here, this is just bizarre to me. This is like a, a weird decision that we end up making where we just... Are 
Arenia don't set up without And then Arenia don't set up without the shield. It's like the lack of cohesive plan just sort of demonstrates that hey, it all starts falling apart. Like you just need to govern. Okay, this fight is over. Okay, regroup, set up. Let's prepare for the next fight. And just outlining that because all shot calling is guys all shot calling literally is is outlining the overall plan for the next fight and uh, 90 percent of pro level shot calling revolves around this it's pro level shot calling revolves usually around identifying what the enemy has um potentially and then identifying what you well identifying what you have identifying what the enemy has and then identifying what you're going to do about those various resources um so like you know, if we're looking at this team, the enemy team, thankfully, are like all DPS. They're not supports, so you have free reign. Now, the scary part for your team is that, again, we have to understand how our team functions. So our team takes time to set up. Our team, like when you're running Bastion Torbjorn, if Bastion Torbjorn start getting pressured, you are going to have a nightmare just setting up. And again, this is a case where the regroup call is super important. Just, okay, guys, regroup group together and then try and get the bastion set up try and get the torbjorn turret set up again and make sure that you're getting that as uh, set up as possible because if you don't they're just going to pick you to pieces which is spoiler alert about to happen quite a bit um especially with like the team comp that they have their team comp is going to be fully reliant on going aggressive if your team comp manages to just set up clump up the enemy team will have very little chance to actually beat you um the big concern you would have is the tracer and genji and honestly it's not that big a deal. Okay, so the call has come out that we swap, we're swapping off Bastion Torp. Again, this is a location where you can put a turret down, so it's, there's actually a little trick you can do if you are stuck fighting in this area. There's no harm in putting a turret here. This turret won't see out down the road, because it, it sits like this. There we go, and then it's got a gun barrel. Right, the turret will sit like this, but what it will do is it will protect your Mercy and Zenyatta. It makes it very difficult for Genji and Tracer to get in because the only angles they'll have on it are when they are already on this bridge. So it's very difficult to sort of get rid of this, um, and that will just work as a sort of burner turret on its own while the enemy team are still pushing forward and trying to group up. It will just make what this Genji is trying to do very difficult. The thing that we shouldn't try and do is like run at this Genji and try and hunt him down. Because Genji has so many outs, so many ways of beating us, and Torbjorn is very easy to beat for the for the Genji because he just has to get near like if he gets near us and just puts right clicks on our head, we explode pretty quickly. Uh, like we're doing the these forward motions, we're running forward and we're sort of leading our team from the front, but for Torbjorn, we can't really be doing this. Okay, so Widow is top left. So this line here. Widow is over here. I think you're fine building the turret up to level 2, but then we can go and deal with that Widow. I'll be very disappointed if we don't. Okay, we, we don't. We, we drop down instead. You are fine just keeping that turret there, and this is where just observation helps. This is also where people should, like, if you are playing against an enemy Widowmaker and they're good, people should be keeping tabs on her positioning, and you should be keeping tabs on her positioning at all times. Um, the, like, yeah. anytime the Widow moves somewhere and starts shooting from somewhere, that has to be called out, because the more people know, the easier this gets. Um, Widow, as well, in, like, this position is extremely dangerous, like, either here or here, because she has a clear line of sight down towards the spawns, and so you're leaving Eichenwald spawns usually from the two doors, and Widow has sight on pretty much both of those. Um, it will be very difficult to leave spawn door. Wow, I am an idiot. <laughs> so, like, you're fine building this turret up, but then we got to go deal with that Widow. Dropping down here, again, we got no tanks, we got no nothing. What? Does the turret come down when the Torbjorn dies? Did not actually know that. Did not actually know that, but we opt to swap off the Torb, right? It was called a while ago that we need to swap off Torb, and one of the questions that was submitted in the email was like, how, how do we deal with 6 DPS? 
playing tanky, playing durable, and playing as a group is always going to be the best answer. Uh, having a Lucio instead of the Zenyatta would actually work quite nicely as well. Just because the Zen is very vulnerable to all the DPS flying around, the Lucio basically will make it hard for situations like this, where one Ampered Up will start fixing up a huge amount of this. Um, so, like, we, we need to... We need to just make sure that we're playing in a way that is safe. So their team, like, if you think about their team in terms of statistics, right? Uh, this axis would be output. It's called out. And then this is time. Right, so in terms of damage, let's do damage in pink. In terms of damage output, their team is going to be like this. Like, their team is just all damage output all the friggin' time. Our team is going to be more like this, right? It's it's way shallower. So if we just try and engage them in a DPS race, we're going to lose. Um, because they do more damage than we do. There's, there's no way around that. Uh, but if we talk about healing output over time, well, their healing output is literally like Soldier 76. So their healing output is like this. Our healing output is like this. Uh, wrong color. Right? So suddenly, if we engage them in a long fight, even though their damage is higher than ours, our healing is way better than theirs. And so if you combine, like, if you take damage output and subtract healing output from our team and get a net result, it will basically look like this, where the total output, the net output of their team is going to be like down here. And our team is going to be, especially with things like shields and stuff like that, is going to be more up here. Um, these lines should be straighter. But our output overall is going to be better than their team. So we want to be playing slow. We want to be playing clumped and we want to make sure that they can't leverage any huge amounts of burst. The longer these fights go, the more this output difference will matter. The more snappier fights are and like the less our healing is applied or the less our barriers work, the weaker we are. Nice. And so stuff, you know, stuff like walling people off and just doing some damage is fine. One thing I'll comment on on the tracer, just right click this. When it's a tracer, like, uh, she's got no recall, but chances are she's going to have a blink. And this is what ends up happening if you try and just left click down a tracer. Is she'll start getting frozen and then she'll just blink away. And she'll be fine. Chasing a Genji, like with other people dealing DPS, sure. Chasing a Genji away. But the left click is fine. Then we just want to regroup. And again, we're just playing defensively. Play around the tanks. Okay, free soldier. Easy. Dead. Regroup. My brother, I think, is playing some very loud music in his room. I don't know if that's coming through, but it's 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 very, like, choral music. Oh! oh we jumped on that. Wow. Wow. I, I want to see that again. I want to see that again in slow motion. Woohoo! Oh man, look at that flip. Look at that flip, it's beautiful. It's absolutely divine. Lovely. And then we la and we stick the landing, we actually land. We're AI okay. This is part of, like, the new Mercy is part of why I think Tracer is actually like, having a tougher time these days, because Pulse Bomb picks are no longer as super powered as they used to be. This Tracer is running rampant on the team. Again, stuff like a Reinhardt here, rather than like the Winston, like you're running triple tank, but honestly I would love to see, if you're running the Winston, then you've got to be using the Winston to go and deal with the, um, the Widow. Like that, the Winston has to be dealing with that. If you just ran a Reinhardt here, parked him, parked him in front of the payload, like here, and then just kill the, like anyone who tries to come around, you just take your time and kill them one by one while the Reinhardt blocks off three people. That would work amazingly, amazingly better. I also thought I had more health than that. My apologies. Wait, Arena, where are you going? Uh, there was. I'm pretty sure there was a tracer back here. They have a Reaper now. He's going to kill me. Yeah, yeah he's dead. Like. Uh, why this? Well, I landed it. I landed priority for your team needs to be to regroup at pretty much all times. So like this moment here, this is where short calling can come in of, okay, there is a tracer there, you found it, you're putting some pressure on it, she recalls, and then she starts going off this way. Roadhog just needs to come back to your team. Like, Roadhog versus Tracer as a duel is a duel that the Tracer will just 
feed off and feed off and feed off, come back with the pulse bomb. And the tracer doesn't need to engage that roadhog. She's just going to run ar run away, and the roadhog's just going to be busy following you guys around. Meanwhile, there's fighting happening over here. Their team is just pulling yours apart, and they they don't even really need to plan to do it. And so, like, you're in, ending up in situations where your tank is... One of your tanks is chasing around a tracer in the back. The Winston is trying to deal with another threat on the back line. And so you just have Soldier and Widow on this front line just firing shots in. And if Soldier and Widow can do that, they're just going to kill everyone. So it's not putting a lot of pressure out. Widow's on the high ground, so just be a little bit careful about that. Honestly, I'm fine with the Winston doing this, by the way. Uh, if Supreme Meep is meme machine, like... If if they are just going to play Winston on this, uh, just jumping on the Widow every single time and just killing her and then coming back, okay, okay. Okay, they commit a lot of ultimates into this. That's a frozen Genji. And let's see. I don't know if you guys can hear this music. Holy shit. Uh, let's see. The blizzards are touch wasteful, but like you're using mortar stall. We come back on the mate. Sights, wall, good. We try and freeze him. <laughs> I love that. He walked around the wall. Yes, yes, he's going to do that. Um, the wall is fine. And like, I actually, I like this as well, because this adds more wall, so you basically got the wall here, and the wall here. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's quite nice. I'm dead. Can't hear the music, okay. And then we get picked off and killed, but we have managed to stall for a while. Are we going to Lucio now? Okay, we've, we're running through the entire gamut. We're going to three supports. Honestly, I think the, the biggest issue with this team lineup at the moment is just lack of damage. If I just look at this team lineup, who's killing things? Um, that, that's sort of my question. Who is actually killing things on this team? It ain't May. May doesn't kill things well. She, she can, but she's not great at it. Uh, right clicks are slow. They... They, they do high damage, but they're fiddly and finicky. They can kind of work. Uh, the Roadhog can kill stuff, but with Genji, Tracer, and the, now are like a Reaper mix in, Widowmaker's shooting from three miles away, so just standing three miles away. The only things he's realistically killing are pro maybe the Reaper, but hooking Reaper. As he tends to backfire for Roadhog, so someone who's been playing a lot of um, Reaper lately, whenever a Roadhog hooks me, I just hold down left mouse button. And when he lands the first shot, I land a shot on him and I heal up a lot of what he's just done to me. Uh, I heal quite a big chunk and then I just dodge the next shots and kill him. Um, so he's not going to be able to deal with the Reaper. Not really able to deal with the Tracer and Genji super well. He's just sort of absorbing attention. Uh, the Winston can kill things. It can kill the Widowmaker pretty reliably. It maybe put pressure on the Tracer and, Winst and Genji. So Winston doing some, but he's not really a killer. He's more of a, a pressure piece. Zarya... It like, with the way that you guys have been picked apart, Zarya's never going to have time to build the momentum necessary to actually turn into a killing machine. Zenyatta is going to be just fighting for his life this entire time. Um, we'd intended it for it to be Zarya and Zen, yeah. So the Zenyatta's going to be having a really rough time this game because Genji, Tracer, and Widowmaker are probably all gunning for him. So he's not going he's going to be mostly preoccupied with just keeping himself alive. And then Mercy, of course, not going to do much damage-wise. So it's like, who's killing stuff? And like the, the Lucio also doesn't turn into to killing things. So if we think about the output graph and we look at our team lineup, our output is actually very small. Which means, a team, which means a fight has to go ridiculously long to be able to actually out output their team, out net DPS their team, basically. Okay. See, this is what I've noticed with Roadhog versus Reaper. It's like, even with our DPS support, the Reaper still can get away. And he goes super low, but you need other DPS pieces. Good. I like the no recall calls, by the way. 
This is one of the important things, like certain things are very important to call out if you are doing, if you are trying to do perfect comms. Uh, Tracer's Recall, Reaper Wraith Form, May Ice Block, Zarya's Barriers, all very, very good to call out. So, it's a small Lucio thing. When you hear the, um, when you hear the May Blizzard, just happened, uh, swap to speed pretty much instantaneously. The most important thing is just to clear people away from that space where it's probably going to be landing. So, do you answer if you're finding around a point, the, the blizzard's going to be on the point. So just swap to speed boost and then move as quickly as you can away from it. Just clear out the most logical, like the first thing you've got to do is clear out the most logical place for the blizzard to go. And yeah. Uh, to me, like the big issue uh, you guys are running into is, okay, now we're going to junk rat. Now stuff can actually die. Uh, although Junkrat, again, isn't the most reliable killer. What would I recommend? Um, Soldier would always be a good pick. McCree would actually be really strong here as well. Um, you could, in theory, run a Genji as well. If you're running Genji, I'd say the Zen should probably swap to Ana and then just play around Ana boosts and just sustain, like, just play the full Genji carry and go from there. It's a good Maywall from their team. I just want to like point out in this fight we're about to see. Like we get a graph, and then it's like okay, so the wall off stops a lot of the damage coming in. Okay, we've got a follow up on a lot of heroes. Just I'm just watching the kill feed more than anything, and it's like there should have been kills coming there, and it's like the only kill that's happened came from mayhem, from total mayhem from the junkrat, and so it's like. There's just there's not enough DPS, and I know you guys are um, support players predominantly, uh, but hey, you need DPS. As much as support mains, especially lately, have liked to to rankle about DPS players. Oh, DPS! Blah, 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 blah. Um, d you need DPS. You d you do need DPS. Stay behind the barrier. Pressure the widow. Good. The Ryan should be peeling back now, and your team should be as well. So, very important thing, very important skill, keep track of the Reinhardt barrier. So you should just be watching your friendly Reinhardt barrier. Okay, we're sub 1000. We should be a little bit scared. Okay, now we're probably getting to the sub 500. Okay, now we should be peeling back. Like, this Reinhardt is, needs to regenerate the shield at this point. It's been up for a long time, we've been just doing trading back and forth, but we need to regenerate this. Now's the time to speed boost and say, hey guys, come back, regenerate. There's no need to just keep on poking around this corner. And again, we're sort of running into the issue where we can't really kill anything from this distance because we're relying on the Junkrat. The Rhinoc just sort of backs away without warning, seemingly. During that time, people can die. And again, this is where like peeling back together can be a big deal because if you had the Reinhardt stood here, you could just be swinging on this Tracer on the Genji who dashed in. All that kind of stuff would be easy for him to deal with rather than trying to deal with this frontline stuff. Uh, I like this from the Reinhardt. Did he teleport? No, he just ran in. Uh, this from the Reinhardt, like, isn't too bad. Because he's blocking off, like, the problem you guys have been having is you've been finding Tracer, Genji, Mei, Reaper, whatever, with a Soldier 76 and a Widowmaker shooting at you the entire time. I think I just see Reaper, like, sneak his way and he just, like, runs through. This needs calling, by the way. Uh, that the Reaper is running in like that, because that is usually an ult, and that is, like, you need to react. Even if it wasn't an ult, the Reaper just running in enough is probably enough to warrant the sound barrier. But this is sort of the, the issue with running the triple support. Is that you guys don't have the DPS, basically. Welcome to Overwatch, Monster. Thank you, Chaplin009. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good to have you on board. Let me bring this up. There we go. Oh, yeah. Who's overly supportive? It's a team from um, Scrim Central. If you are going to play, um, like, quadruple support, what I would say is that the Zenyatta really has to just focus on dealing as much DPS as possible. And you probably want... You probably want a Symmetra in there, to be honest. 
Sim would actually have been quite nice in that final point. The biggest issue is, like, literally the only issue... Most supports in a Genji as a viable team comp. Honestly, wouldn't be too bad if the Genji is good enough. It wouldn't be, like, top tier meta, but you could probably smash some people with it, especially in goal plat. The only issue you would face is, like, this... You've got to basically make sure that the supports survive long enough. So this this actually used to be a thing. Um, back when you could stack heroes, I remember something like this, where people ran comps of, like, you play Winston, and then you had just everything supports the Winston. Everything built around the supports. Who's you use for supports? No Anna. Okay, Zarian and Shimada. So, yeah, Sim, uh, Sim, Mercy, Zen, Lucio. Genji, Zarya. Uh, yeah, I can see that working. When people used to play this comp where it's like five supports on a Winston, and then they would just try and make the Winston kill everything, uh, or it's like two Winstons and four supports. What people ended up doing, though, to beat it was you just went and killed the supports. You just ignored the Winstons and killed the supports. Um, and that's sort of what I would be scared of in those instances. There was no Ana back then, yeah. So... Okay, let's have a look at our team comp. This is a scary team comp. Like, anytime you look at a team comp, what's your victory condition? How, like, the way I always do it is how is this team fight going to play out? Who's going to get first blood? Who's going to get second blood? That kind of stuff. Like, you're just looking at the team comp and thinking, how is this fight actually going to go? So you're looking for Widow to get the opening kill, usually. Um, or just at least keep shooting from the back line, hopefully unpressured. If Widow Maker gets a kill, okay, you got... These two who can run in, and the maid that can run in, but that instantaneous burst damage, not quite there. Enemy team is usually going to back away, so Widowmakers usually have a hard time getting a second kill follow up. If they do, then great. Widowmaker can actually take over a fight in a huge way like that. But usually what ends up happening, especially on like Iconvol, for example, is if the first blood comes in, the enemy team will pull back a little bit and then start pulling back towards the point. Widowmaker's going to have a hard time sort of turning that into further kills. So you're going to be completely reliant on these pieces, and again, it's just the follow-up kills. This is why I like stuff like Soldier 76, because once the door is open, Soldier can go in and get tons of kills. Reaper can do exactly the same as well. It's why I've been enjoying Reaper, because once you get into that fight, once the fight has started, you just start blowing people down. You start blowing through people, and it's kind of crazy. Whereas the Mei has a hard time sort of collecting those kills. I also, I just don't like offensive Mei. Um, Mei works very well when the enemy team has to come into you, because you can split them. Um, but it's much, much harder to play on offense. Not impossible, but it's hard. So the team is debating whether or not the Widowmaker is a smurf. My mind put the stuff out of your mind. This, this, uh, like, I... One coffee time, well, at one point during coffee time, we're going to do something about talking about mentalities and playing mentalities. This is actually like a really interesting tangent that I'm going to go on, a ramble, um, because I love this topic. Um, I like seeing and trying to figure out the reasons why people play and the reasons why people do the things they do. Um, some people try and be the best. Some people want to be the best. Um, and what was fun was during the, the sort of early days of the beta and when the um, team clickbait was basically sort of playing a lot together, was reading into each other of like what is Stylos's goal what is my goal what is Valkyrie's goal how do we differ from each other what is Ryan's goal what is Miska's goal how do we all like synergize how do we all think about each other um Stylosa, for example wants to be the best Stylosa is very competitive wants to be just very very good at the game for me it's slightly different I want to be very very good at the game but I would rather be good at just about everything I would be I am happy having accounts like I would be happy having a 3.8k account on every hero in Masters. I would be super happy with that um, because I, I like that. I am all about understanding the game. I want to understand every faucet of it. I want to understand every aspect of it and sort of inspect it and figure out how this game works and sort of get into its guts and go, oh, this is, this is interesting. How does this function? Oh, what if you put this and this together? Oh, that's interesting. And that's sort of my drive. Whereas someone like Valkyr wants to be the best farer. He wants to be very, very good at this one specific thing. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to him so much if he loses games because of it, but he wants to be the best at Farah. Um, Ryan, for example, I think just wants to have a good time, wants to play competitively, wants to be at a fairly high level, but he doesn't have that extra oomph, that extra competitive urge to sort of go further with it. Um, 
And so it's sort of like understanding how all these mentalities work and also what ends up happening if you go up against someone who is better than you. For me, I want to challenge them. I want to play against them, see how it goes, and then try and understand, okay, well, they beat me like by doing this. How do I learn and develop from that? Well, some people get scared of stronger opponents. Some people go, well, this Widowmaker is better than us, so I don't want, like, I hate playing against it. I just don't want to play against it. For me, I always see it as a challenge. Okay. Uh, yeah. Many Symmetra both have this problem, trying to convince people that even though they rolled in the kills on defense, it's not going to go as well as an attack. Yeah, on attack, May and Symmetra don't work super well. So we step out and fire a slam in us with rockets. It's always a bit scary. General advice on Oakenvold, by the way, don't leave from the front door. This door is usually spanned out. Leave from the side door up here. It's much safer. Same time frame as well, and you can actually go around the back this way to get to the main choke. It's just safer. There's actually no reason to leave from this doorway. Symmetra is like putting turrets up here. Uh, Junkrat's like putting traps here. Just don't leave by that door. It's, it's lazy. It's lazy and inefficient. They have Symmetra, so this is like instant good information. So Winston May should be prioritizing cleaning up the Symmetra stuff. They have a Torbjorn. And we're starting to sort of piece together what the enemy team is. Focus on healing up the tanks. People need to be very careful about peeking or poking out. The first thing you guys need to do, so when you're playing against the Metro and Torbjorn and stuff, it's to me it's like doing your chores, you know, before you go and have fun. It's it's checking off a list of like, okay, have I done this? Have I done this? Or it's like my work day these days, which is, you know, have I responded to the emails I needed to respond to? Have I checked social media? Have I uh, uploaded a video or set a video to go live? Have I made a thumbnail? Have I done this? Check, 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 check. Okay, now I can go and do stuff. And Symmetra Torbjorn is exactly the same thing. It's even when you're leaving spawn, it's okay. Well, we got the path up to the main choke. Have we cleared it off Symmetra turrets? Okay. Do we know where the Torbjorn turret is? Uh, okay. Can we kill the Torbjorn turret without needing to break a barrier? Okay. Can we get to the choke safely? Okay. And it, it's just going through this checklist mentally of, have we dealt with all this stuff? Okay, now we can start moving forward. Now we don't have to worry about turning a corner and there's a Torbjorn turret. Or turning a corner and there's three Symmetra turrets. So, now let's deal with the next threat in line, okay? Let's just go down the list of threats. This fire has been overextending, this fire has been sort of playing super aggressively. If you guys support your Widowmaker, protect your Widowmaker, she could probably deal with it. But you've got to play around the Widow. You can't just let Widow wander off and try and one versus one this stuff. Okay, well that's... Like this, this is actually correct from us just to try and hunt down this fire. Be very careful about that widow. So let's just reposition. Don't what? Why are we doing this? Oh, I I, I don't want to look. I don't want to even. I'm gonna slow. It's like a friggin' horror movie. Oh, thank God she isn't looking at us. Okay, we shoot the median. Okay, she isn't looking at us. That's that's good. That's good. Okay, so remember that checklist I went through? Don't, don't stand here. This, this is bad. Stand here. Much, it's much safer. So, remember that checklist? Can we kill the Torbjorn turret without needing to break a barrier? Yes. So this should actually be very high priority for your team. So if you're talking about like shot calling and leading, um, just setting out the game plan for your team. Okay, let's, step one, let's get to the choke, don't die. Just prioritize them doing that. Get to the choke, don't die, stay behind tanks, stay protected. Okay, done that, check. Tick. Okay, next, let's kill the turret. Okay, check, turret is dead, let's push him. And it's it's breaking it down like that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, how do you play around a Widowmaker on your team? Isn't she kind of a lone wolf character? No, 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 absolutely not. Um, Widowmaker needs people either, like... The issue with Widow Farah as a matchup is that if the Widow and Farah are just one versus one in, the Farah will actually win probably about 60-70% of the time. If you talk to good Farah players and you ask them, oh, how do you feel about Widowmakers? They all usually say, oh yeah, I can usually kill a Widowmaker as long as people aren't protecting her. Um, it's it's super easy to do because once the Farah starts landing hits on the Widow, the Widow doesn't have the mobility to survive long enough to kill the Farah usually. 
The Widow needs something in front of her, so you either need like Zarya protecting her, Winston Bubble on her, or Winston body blocking rockets for her, healing to keep her alive so she doesn't have to instantly reposition if a rocket hits her. Uh, all this kind of stuff facilitates the Widowmaker doing stuff. So Widowmaker, right now, should be thinking, okay, I need to deal with the Farah, but I can also kill the turret. They have no barriers, so I can also probably just kill anyone on their team. If the Widowmaker wants to do that, she's going to need protection. She can't just stand in the middle of this... Um, of this space. You can't just stand in the choke point and shoot through because she's going to die. So she'd need people protecting her. Uh, so that's sort of how Widow needs team play, I guess. Swapping to the Mercy, I don't agree with at all. Honestly, you guys would just probably smash this to pieces, by the way, with a very aggro dive. So honestly, I would love to see a Lucio out of this team. I'm just curious, because how many supports do we have now? Right, yeah, yeah, we have three supports. Like, if you're attacking on Iconvald especially, um, Lucio is just extremely good. The idea is that the, the less you stand in the choke point, the better, basically. Especially against the Symmetra. Also, at this point, they probably all have 150 extra shields. Um, even then, Widow could still probably be effective. Like, she's going to be good enough to put the Farah under pressure, and she's going to be good enough to clear the turret out. I, don't, I think I, another healer is not the answer here, however. Okay, we have the Symmetra. But this is going to happen every single time. But your team has no answer to this Farah. There's the shield gem, by the way, just activated. Nice. Winston, so, okay, Winston misplayed that. So in these instances, Winston shouldn't be afraid. Uh, it takes a lot of slashes to kill a Winston. Uh, the fact that he's hit by the grenade as well means that he's lost 100 hit points. So he, Winston can kill this Genji a lot faster than the Genji can kill him. He just needs to sit on top of him, basically, and just hold left mouse button. So the Winston shouldn't be afraid of like backing out there. He should just stay on top of the target, hold left click, and kill him. Honestly, the Symmetra here, um, if you had extra DPS, I would be okay with it. Because you just, uh, the, having the Reinhardt would help, it helps a lot. But the idea is you just put that barrier up and just run behind it. You guys all have to run in behind it though. And be very careful about their Symmetra orbs. Like stop, this is where the Lucio would also help. Let's go, 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 go. Just a shame. But like, motions like this, this is where I get annoyed. This is what annoys me, is like, if you have a plan, stick to it decisively. Like, we should just be following this Reinhardt in. And this is where like a speed boost, for example, would be extremely strong. Rather than having the Zen Mercy. You'd just be speed boost, and you'd already be on the enemy team. But this fire is going to devastate you. Uh, Winston ult motherfuckers! Oh wait, what happened? Uh, yeah, that, that, that was a Farah. Spoiler. We also don't have literally anything to take care of the Farah. Yeah. That Genji's dead. That, that... Wow. Go, go, go. Uh, YouTube. I think we know what's... This, this poor fucking Genji, oh my... This just breaks my heart. I'm gonna get him! I'm gonna get- oh fuck! Oh, save me, Telegraph Paul! Oh no! Oh no, oh no. Oh no. Oh dearie me. That all went wrong. That all went quite wrong. Right, enough. Uh, yeah, wow. <laughs> Fucking hell. Okay, follow the barrier in. Oh my god, the Farah. Stuff that is not useful in comms, by the way, is oh my god, the Farah. This is a weird thing of like communication. 
the core with communication okay the, the core idea of any communication and i know this is somewhat like oh we're also just playing with some friends and stuff like that having a good time but if you want to have like crisp crystal clear comms make sure that everything you are broadcasting to your team is actually conveying information oh my god the farah isn't actually conveying information it's it's uh it's venting but you want to have some kind of information of far behind far above far somewhere Far out location. It's usually personal location. Personal location is usually the best piece of advice you can information you can give. Also, if certain ultimates are up, stuff like that is also very very useful. Ooh, mercy. Okay, back up, back up, back up, back up, back up. No, 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 no. Thank you. I can't see what that donation is just yet. Hey. Know that the drain on your sanity is appreciated. It's it's an interesting one. Um, playing very non-meta. Because now we're on Zarya and Jesus. So if you're playing on Zarya, like remember three stages of Zarya. I've explained this before, and I'll explain it again very quickly. Uh, building, maintaining, ultimate. So you're building, trying to get more charge, to usually to about 80. Then you are maintaining until about you drop down to about 60, and then you're going to go back to building. And then when you have your ultimate, uh, you play differently. So in each of the three stages, you're changing how you play, changing how you use your barriers. At the moment, we're in building phase, so we do the right thing. We jump in front of the barrier, take some damage get 40% charge, and then we make a mistake because we're, we're still in front of the barrier. We, we, we shouldn't still be in front of Reinhardt at this point. We, we have... we. You, you notice that we're dying. Um, so, usually at this moment, like, after you've used your barrier, you step behind your Reinhardt's barrier, let the Reinhardt push forward, and put a projected barrier on him, so he's absorbing all this damage, so then you have high charge, and then when your barrier comes back off cooldown, you step in front of the barrier again, and you can push forward. You could probably just take out this turret. Uh, Torbjorns make it very easy for you, but they, of course, have extra armor, extra shields. Like, their team's a bit of a nightmare to deal with. Shut it. The Pharah! The Pharah! So, the big problem there, again, was... Their team was killing your team way faster, and like their fire was just had a free reign nonstop because no one could hit her, and so their time to kill was way faster than ours. Unfortunately, uh, this is sort of my general advice: if you are going to play with like a team lineup of, you know, oh, we're going to run a ton of supports, maybe a tank, and maybe one DPS. If you're going to do that, make sure that you the DPS play you have is extremely good, um, and make sure that you have the ability to flex between stuff like Genji Soldier and stuff like that. Uh, your Zenyada, especially as well, is going to have to play more aggressively and sort of become more DPS than support because you need to kill things. And like Overwatch is kind of a game of kill things. Just going back to, you know, the the output graphs. So in a conventional like two 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 against their team lineup, the the net output, so net output meaning net output meaning um damage dealt minus healing minus barriers. So like how much actual damage is going through and actually having an effect to outweigh their healing. The enemy team, uh let's pick a different colour with red enemy teams net output probably looks something like like burst output is going to start actually relatively high okay red is a terrible choice of color for this let's start with yellow like it's going to start relatively high and then drop down as the healing and barriers kick back in and then it's going to slowly start coming back over time because their burst is so high with your output it was more like we're starting down low and then we're never really getting anywhere. Like, sure, we're dealing damage, but they have enough barriers and stuff, and then it's like everyone's just dead, so our net output just drops. Because this burst damage is usually killing someone instantaneously because the fire is just uncontested, diving onto the back line, getting a kill, and going from there. Did the enemy team ever have a healer? Nope. Just Soldier 76. Um, who, who did all the healing on their team. Just kind of feels bad, man. I mean, they had regeneration, but this Faro just stomped over and over and over again, and it's just because you can't out-heal Faro rockets. Like, you can't out-heal a Faro dive when she's uncontested, so, yeah. It's kind of difficult. If you are, like, maybe changing the Windsor for a D.Va would have worked, but even then, the question is still, who's going to kill someone? Can you actually kill the enemy team? And if you can't do that, it doesn't really matter too much. Um, 
Do I imagine this why you see more success with the Genji? Because I imagine the plan is usually, okay, let's survive as long as possible. Nano boost the Genji. Okay, Nano Genji kills everyone. We win. Um, but I, I can see this plan starting to struggle, especially when you start getting a round diamond. When people can start confirming kills a lot quicker, when people start getting better at just soloing people down, getting kills um, very quickly, which usually starts creeping in around high plat diamond, um, you're going to have a very hard time sort of getting any further. This is on old patch or new? I believe this is new patch. Yeah, Mercy was new. Because new diva can effectively kill Farah. Uh, effect, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say effectively. I'd say I would go as far as to say new diva can finish a Farah. I wouldn't say effectively kill Farah. I think effectively killing Farah with a diva is difficult, but not impossible. Um, but I wouldn't say effective. Like when you when you say effectively kill Farah, I think of stuff like Soldier, McCree, Widow. Those guys can effectively kill Farah. Stuff like Zen, Diva, Zarya, occasionally, yeah. Anyway. Uh right. I'm gonna start taking some questions. So give me questions about um supporting if you must, communication, May Torbjorn. It's a very sort of all over the place video just difficult to sort of hammer down on a specific thing entirely um just remember and i think we'll wrap up on this before we go to questions your calling is as simple as just having a plan for every fight your calling is no more complicated than okay next fight we're going to use this ultimate and this ultimate so next fight we're going to dragon blade um like in uk scrims for example the plans would always basically boil down to okay next fight we're going to dive the zenyatta force transcendence then dragon blade that's it that's literally the plan uh that's all you need and a lot of the plans sort of do revolve around that and just develop off the back of that next fight we're going to just break the diva mech fire off soldier roll clean up afterwards and see what happens like it can be that simple but as long as there is a plan and people are playing towards that plan it works extremely well Okay, I'm going to boot up Overwatch and then start answering some of the questions appearing in the chat. Huh. Let's get a bit of face while I transition over here. <laughs> 